I'm saying hi neighbor today to Dr. Sunil Dand. And uh, Dr. Dand, I believe you're in uh, New York, is it? And if you would kind of tell folks who you are, a little bit about your businesses, and uh, maybe even get right into, uh, you just spent the last week uh, on a COVID floor treating patients. Thank you for uh, giving us part of your time. Sure, it's uh, my pleasure to be here, Jody. I uh, do work in New York as well. Thankfully, with the situation there, I'm actually not in New York at the moment. I'm working in Massachusetts. So I am in the Boston area and I work in a, a couple of different healthcare facilities. I, to, just to, to back up a bit, I'm an internal medicine doctor. I graduated in 2008 from uh, Baltimore, a residency program there. And I've spent most of my time since then in Massachusetts. I do a mix of inpatient and outpatient medicine. My outpatient work is very much focused on wellness and preventive medicine, which is a, a huge passion of mine. And away from clinical work, I enjoy writing, I have a blog, and I also have a, a healthcare startup as well. So a lot of things going on, but obviously the last few weeks have been entirely focused on this pandemic. And uh, like many people, when I was first seeing the news stories emerge from China back in January, it all just seemed a very long way away. And then as each week passed, uh, everything seemed to get closer. The pandemic spread across different countries and then arrived here. But Jody, I'm, I'm sure you're in the same boat and I can speak for healthcare professionals. None of us would have expected us to be where we are today, six weeks ago. I mean, it's really astonishing the way things have progressed and, and panned out across the country. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I keep going back to the statement that uh, a sports editor used when he was talking about uh, the effect of the pandemic at the very beginning. He said, there's no blueprint for this. And I thought that was so perfect. That really describes every avenue of life, our uh, professional vocations, our home lives, our social uh, interactions. There's no playbook. Exactly. Yep. I mean, every facet of everyone's life has been affected, uh, some more so than others, depending on what you do for work. Uh, for us as medical professionals, we have really had to step into the fire here. Um, none of us have encountered a situation like this before. We had to prepare in a, a very short amount of time. Uh, fortunately, the healthcare institutions that I work in uh, were better with some others than with protective equipment and ensuring staff had adequate amounts and that lots were being ordered and, and bought. Uh, so that has thankfully been less of an issue and it's more just preparing ourselves to deal with an illness that we haven't seen before. And of course, the biggest comparison is made with the flu and influenza is of course a, a very, very widespread illness that causes a lot of deaths. Something like 60,000 people die every year in the US, 700,000 across the world. And, it's, it's something that we've just kind of accepted in society. We have vaccines, which are not always effective, unfortunately, but we do have a vaccine and we have some level of herd immunity. As a doctor, I'm, I'm very used to dealing with the flu in the winter, especially vulnerable groups will come into hospital, the elderly, those with chronic conditions, and they'll be very badly affected. And we have set protocols of how we manage it, how we deal with the associated complications. I have to say this illness, um, COVID-19, is unlike anything I or any other doctor has seen before. Um, the time course is very unique. It takes um, several days to manifest symptoms from first being infected. Then the symptoms can last at a very low level for a few days before sometimes disappearing and then returning again. And we see the danger period as the seven to 10 day mark when people can go into respiratory failure and that's when they come into hospital. The cases that we've been seeing, um, the chest x-rays, the imaging that's done on admission, uh, you get really widespread bilateral changes in both lungs and the person is having difficulty breathing. They're initially placed on a, a nasal cannula and that's where we hope to actually keep them from there while we monitor their recovery, um, but unfortunately, some of the time it doesn't work and they get worse and end up needing to go to the intensive care unit and then being on a, a ventilator as a last, last case scenario. So we're learning new things every day and from a medical scientific perspective, it really is um, 
a process which is in flux every single day. Sometimes it feels like every hour you're getting new information, you're getting new protocols, you're learning new things about how this virus manifests itself in humans. But I know uh, when we first started the call, you said you're learning about the, how the disease progresses. You're learning things uh, in, in that regard. Can you talk about that a little bit more? And you've already mentioned it, you know, how people can go into respiratory failure quickly. And I also, I'm kind of asking a lot of questions here at once, but I know one of the, what I'm told is a myth out there is that, well, the people who need respirator are ventilators the people who actually die from this, they already have a heavy comorbidity. They already had a chronic condition. Uh, is that uh, accurate? Can you dispel that? Can you kind of take all that and unpack it? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very important question you ask, Jody, is who is most likely to be affected by it? Because there's such a large group that are barely affected, many are completely asymptomatic, which makes dealing with this illness and planning for it very difficult. Uh, some of the risk factors you've already touched on, so undoubtedly um, what we know is that the elderly population, those over the age of 80, anyone with any comorbidities, specifically those affecting the heart or lungs, smokers are heavily at risk, um, overweight and obesity is also uh, being seen to, to really affect people who get coronavirus, disproportionate numbers who are in the ICU are overweight or obese, which obviously is associated with other comorbidities, and then male sex as well. Uh, being male, and this is being witnessed across the world, is a risk factor. Those are the main five, I would say, and those particular groups need to take extra care. Uh, some of the tragic cases which we're obviously seeing on the news of young, healthy people are very much out there as well and and it's very scary uh, those are obviously the the minority um, but for some reason what we're finding is that COVID-19 really badly affects some young people with no medical history and we're not sure why and there could well be a genetic part to this as well because we've seen stories of families where three members will be in the ICU and they're not any more at risk than other families. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is something we're learning more about um, and, and needing more research. But I would definitely say, say that those risk factors are the, the really big ones for getting sick from COVID. And, and what is the course of treatment? I mean, there's no cure and there's no uh, medication to, uh, I guess, other than treating the symptoms, I guess. Uh, so, uh, what what can you do? What is the treatment once you're in the hospital? Exactly. Well, well this is where um, we don't have a lot to offer at the moment beyond supportive treatment, as with a lot of viruses that affect the respiratory tract. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that they're on oxygen. Enough oxygen is getting to their lungs. Then we want to ensure that uh, if they have fevers, we're giving them medicines to bring the fevers down, such as simple Tylenol, which we can give orally or intravenously. Uh, beyond that, if they are very dehydrated or have gone into kidney failure, we would give them fluids, but we want to be careful about that because we don't want fluid to build up on their lungs. There are other treatments which are being uh, proposed. Uh, many are currently undergoing trials. I, I can speak for my hospital is that we are using a combination of two medications, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for a five day course. And generally I've seen that they've been well tolerated just over five days. It's unlikely to lead to any major complications and they're, they're common medications anyway. The jury is still out on that combination. Um, we're going to get a lot more data in. And, uh, you know, one, two, two, th two other things. One is the renal failure. I, I'm reading that this has a kind of under the radar, under the public's radar, very much on the medical community's radar, uh, that uh, COVID uh, has a tendency that can create uh, problems with the kidneys. And also, then what is the quality of life after recovery? What are the lasting effects? of uh, having COVID-19? Yeah, uh, well, the renal failure, um, from what I've seen in patients, is very much linked to if they're dehydrated or overwhelmingly septic. 
So we give them fluids and then that should correct. And I haven't seen that become a, a long-term issue where, where I can envision it being more of a problem is in someone who's critically ill and in what we call multi-organ failure. So lots of different organs are affected. And if somebody actually does, unfortunately, go into kidney failure and require dialysis, that is something that would be difficult to come off in the long term. I mean, hopefully if they're younger, it can reverse. But um, I, I know that from the intensive care unit, there are many stories of organs going into failure, um, the kidneys being one. Uh, we've also seen cardiac complications and even thrombotic complications, which means blood clotting. Um, and all of these things can happen with any overwhelming illness, whether this is more related to COVID and coronavirus, time will tell. As far as you said, your healthcare facility, your, your hospital has done pretty well providing PPEs for uh, the, the professionals who work there. Uh, is my understanding that that's not the case uh, generally for hospitals, that uh, there are some that are really struggling to find uh, the protective equipment. Uh, are you hearing from colleagues who, who have stories like that? Oh, yes. Yeah, very much so. I know in lots of different parts of the, the country, including, as we said, New York, there are big, big issues. And many healthcare facilities have, have got this wrong. They've kind of gone into it at first saying you didn't need a certain level of protective equipment. But what I, I've noticed, at least where I've been working, is doctors have immediately pushed back and said, no, we need N95s. We need face shields. Uh, the biggest issue is with the N95s and ensuring an adequate supply of them. And I don't have any doubt that any healthcare professional, whether it be a doctor, a nurse, or aide, who goes into a room of someone with coronavirus should be wearing an N95. Okay. And, and in your experience on the floor of uh, treating and monitoring uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID patients, uh, are they sicker than, let's say, I don't know, you compared it earlier to influenza, you know, that's one, the, the pandemic we think of. Are these patients generally just uh, less well, just sicker than uh, typical, typical patients? From what I've seen, I would, I would put this into two categories. I've, I've seen a lot of elderly patients who have come in and it's just been like a typical kind of respiratory infection and we, we see them through it where I've seen that the really sick ones more than unexpected, more than I would expect would be the younger patients in their 30s, 40s, 50s who have come in and usually with the flu, we would expect them to bounce back in two or three days. But I've noticed with COVID, it's taking well over a week and right. every single day we'll be trying to get them off oxygen and yeah, it will be more of a struggle. It takes a lot longer. So from that respect, yes, when, when we've seen people come in, uh, especially people who have no history um, and they're bad enough to be in the hospital, that's way beyond anything I've seen with typical influenza or pneumonia. Yeah, I want to make sure that uh, folks hearing and watching or, or listening to this uh, know that yeah, you and I first connected after I had read, I'd seen some of your uh, blogging, your writing on uh, uh, heavenmd.com. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great healthcare professionals and physicians, nurses who are wonderful writers. And uh, you certainly, I think, are at the top of that list for me. Uh, well, you communicate you. so well. And, and, and here's my, my point is you do such a good job of humanizing medicine. Um, you know, you, you can you talk the clinical talk. Uh, but you're not a textbook, you know, you don't glaze people's eyes. Maybe you could if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> oh, I can, yeah, okay. uh, but that bores me as well. <laughs> so the, here's my, my humanizing question here about this uh, disease and the effect it's had on uh, families and society. Because as I understand, uh, uh, many uh, people suffering from uh, COVID-19 are suffering alone without family members around them providing care or encouragement. Uh, and first of all, is that true? And then secondly, if so, uh, that's got to put an additional uh, incalculable strain on the uh, nurses and the staff. Absolutely, yes. And, and um, the people who come into hospital, practically every hospital now has a, a no visitation policy um, to, 
stop with the spread of virus, and that's understandable, that the one time where we do actually bend that rule is if somebody is on what we call comfort care, or uh, they're about to pass away and it's imminent, then we allow family to come in and obviously say their goodbyes and be gowned up and wearing a mask. Yeah, that's, that is allowed. But um, yeah, I mean, typically during any illness, what you want is family and support around you. And it's, it's very difficult for, for all of our patients right now. It's difficult for us as doctors because we want our patients to not feel so alone and to have a morale boost. I've seen various things being done, actually. We're taking iPads into the room, allowing FaceTime, um, making frequent phone calls. I'll often get on speakerphone with the relative in the room with the patient, and we'll all talk together. Uh, just, to, just to let family know, I mean, often with any illness, family is actually more worried than the patient is. And we, we, have, to, we have to take that on board and, and not forget our compassion in healthcare and have this sort of strict Gestapo-like policy. Absolutely not. You can't come into hospital. It's us dealing with your loved one. That's not what healthcare is about. We've, we've made this policy for a certain reason, but we definitely don't want to make patients feel even more lonely while, while they're here. So I can speak for my facilities that we're doing everything we can to keep family in the loop and call them more and, and get them on the line with the patient while we're in the room as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dan, you've seen the, the images, the pictures, the beaches in Florida, the people who are uh, obviously not six feet apart. They're out enjoying the sun and the surf. Uh, I went, uh, I told you just a little bit ago, I, I, I ventured out a while ago to go to the pharmacy and I actually went into the store. First time I've been out in a store probably in about 30 days and this was the uh, Hy-Vee on uh, Broadway here in Columbia. And they've even have big circles now that, that mark six feet apart. Uh, and then they also have uh, one way uh, like uh, road markers on the floors showing the aisles are one way. It of course, sort of snakes mm -hmm. around. Now, uh, not long after being in that store, and I'm the only one besides staff wearing a mask, I did not see any other person in there wearing a mask. And it wasn't exactly packed, but it wasn't exactly light either. Uh, and, and, and a gentleman passes me, I'm going on my one way, I'm going the right way, you know. And he, he comes up the other way, younger guy, I don't know, maybe 30s, he's not wearing a mask. Uh, Am I wrong to think, hey, all you people who aren't uh, adhering to the distancing and to the stay at home unless you have to get out, uh, are, are I, I go to the conclusion, you know what, you all are prolonging this. And those of us who are already complying with all these restrictions, we're going to have to comply a little bit longer because there's so many of you who won't. You're the, the physician. What's your comment on that? Oh, I, I absolutely agree and, and, and sympathize with what you saw as well. I would be frustrated as well. I mean, this is, this is a community effort. Um, we need everybody to practice social distancing, to be yeah, as common sense with hygiene as possible, avoid getting close to people, wash hands, avoid touching your face. And the only way this is going to come to an end is when we see those peaks and then drops off in cases. I mean, nobody wants to see the economy shut down forever and it's not going to be. We are going to restart, we have to restart, uh, but we want to do that sooner rather than later. And everybody needs to play their part and take it very seriously. And anyone who isn't taking it seriously is welcome to come with me on ward rounds or virtually, or I can just tell them what's happening and, and show them that they're young people who are guessing very sick right now and it's unique we haven't seen it before but we would rather keep the hospitalizations and and the unfortunate deaths as low as possible and not have millions of people dying you only need to look around you uh, turn on the news look look what's happening around the world this is not something that's unique to the us it's not something political either it's something which every country no matter what their government from China, Russia, to France, to England, to countries now in, in Southern Asia and Africa are all dealing with this problem and are, are ending up doing the same thing initially, which is social distancing and placing people under lockdown. And if it was purely political or there was some other motive, everyone wouldn't be doing it. Sure. 
Well, and, and I like, I appreciated those distinctions you just made. And I wondered, are there any other uh, myths to dispel or maybe information that uh, you think the public should be more cognizant of? Um, are, are they, what, what would be on that list for you? Like, well, the public just doesn't exactly understand A, B, or C. What would those be? Right. Well, firstly, I would say in terms of symptoms, although a lot of people are asymptomatic, I would encourage anyone to look out for certain low-grade symptoms. Um, one of the most common is loss of smell. And this is being reported across the world. Uh, people will just have this funny sensation in the morning that their coffee is smelling different or they can't taste their breakfast. And that may even be your only symptom. If that happens to you, go and get tested right away, no matter where you are, whether you're in Missouri or New York, uh, you, that is a, a very worrisome symptom to someone who has never had that happen before. Uh, that would be the first thing to be, I, I would urge anyone to just be on the watch out for any symptoms like this. And especially as we're approaching the summer months now, you shouldn't even be getting symptoms of a cold. If you are, that's, that's something, that's a red flag for, for possible COVID. Okay. Um, beyond that, I would say if you do get afflicted with COVID, the chances are that it's going to be a very mild illness and you will recover at home. If after a few days you start to feel more short of breath and unwell, difficulty breathing, that would be an immediate indication to go to the hospital because there's probably only a short window for everything to be reversed and for you to be okay as opposed to in a catastrophic situation. Okay. Uh, I pr appreciate those uh, snippets of advice from from somebody who's on the front line who uh, who has that knowledge. And uh, Dr. Dan, one of your recent blogs, uh, and I might be paraphrasing it wrong, was titled uh, "Let's Not Forget Where This Started or How This Started." Um, and thinking in terms of, well, will there be a COVID-20 or some, some sort of pandemic? You know, mm. SARS uh, apparently was traced to the wet markets in China. This one possibly, probably traced to that source. Uh, and when you're talking about, let's not forget where this started, were you talking about the wet markets? I was talking about the wet markets and, um, I wanted to raise this issue, and I, I think it's very sad that it's being made political now when it shouldn't. Uh, scientists have warned for years that wet markets are prime sources to get crossover of viruses, which pass from animals, sometimes between animals, and then come to humans. Uh, these papers you can look up. I was just actually speaking to a, a global research specialist in, in Florida, an old colleague of mine, who told me that there were, I, I knew this already, but he was going into more depth about all of the warnings from scientists that these wet markets have to close. We have known, obviously since caveman days, that it's, bad, it's a bad idea to have humans and rodents in close proximity to each other. It doesn't take a, a genius to work out that that's not an optimal situation. So it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. And there's all sorts of wild and wonderful theories of, out there about this being deliberate and a, a lab producing it. I'm, I'm just not buying those uh, unless there was some overwhelming evidence of foul play. All of the evidence is suggesting if you do the research, you can go online now and, and look at this, that this started with a single transmission in a wet market, which is quite astonishing to think of as well, that one single person getting it has led to this global catastrophe. But the international community really needs to put pressure on the Chinese government. And this is nothing against China. I'm a huge fan of Chinese culture. I've visited Hong Kong. Many of my best friends are Chinese. I, I, I love the people, I love the culture. But the Chinese government has to be held to account and also immense pressure applied to close those wet markets and then also bring to account what happened at the beginning of this whole pandemic when there was a lot of silence there's evidence that the government knew that this whole pandemic was, or it wasn't a pandemic then, it was just a region of infection spreading in Wuhan. They shut down the rest, travel to the rest of the country, but allowed international flights in and out, which is inexcusable. 
and then the harassment, the deliberate harassment of doctors when they wanted to keep it quiet is also just awful if you see what happened to those initial doctors. Many of them, many of them ended up dying themselves of, of right. COVID. Um, these things have to, have to be brought up. I, I don't think being silent on them out of some, as I put in my article, some misguided sense of political correctness or feeling that you're going to offend anyone, that's not going to help. Um, otherwise, we're just waiting for this to happen again. And, you know, unfortunately, there are players out there, though, who politicize this at every turn. Uh, and, and, and I'm talking about players from every political stripe. Uh, so I appreciate you boiling it down to this isn't about politics. This is about public health. This is about uh, human life. And, um, you know, where do we go from here, though? Because you're dealing with a government that is pretty secretive and it's very, uh, uh, keeps a, a pretty good grasp on uh, people's uh, ability to, to speak, and, you know, including the, exactly. first, the first physician uh, uh, of many, I guess, who actually died from uh, COVID. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Dr. Dan, you've been uh, uh, great uh, to give me part of your time here. You said you're, you've had a couple of days off and I could think of maybe you want to do a million other things than sit here on a Zoom call with me. But when we first connected a couple of years ago for a podcast episode, uh, I remember we talked about some heavy health care type stuff, value-based care and those sorts of things. Uh, but I also then, I was fascinated with the uh, the British monarchy and the, the marriage of Harry and Meghan that was going on about then. And you yeah. had some particular perspective because you you grew up um, kind of a stone's throw from Windsor Castle, right? And uh, uh, can you kind of talk about your life in uh, in the UK there? And, uh, and then I'm going to quiz you on... Uh, if you love to binge what the uh, medical shows that my <laughs> wife and I enjoy uh, produced in the UK. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, as you said, I, I grew up in, in Windsor, actually a little village called Datchet, which is part of Windsor. I uh, spent uh, all of my year, younger years there, teenage years before I went to, to university. So I could practically walk to Windsor Castle. We used to see the Royal family, the queen, her husband, uh, Prince Charles, Diana, when she was alive, going past all the time in their, their cars. And um, I, my, my views on the monarchy have changed over the years. I, growing up, was a little bit more rebellious. Now I'm a, a huge fan. I, I think that having a unifying factor like the monarchy is, is great. I, I realize that might be a sensitive topic in, in the US because you fought for a long time to get rid of the monarchy. But I think as they exist now in the UK, with essentially no political power, whatsoever uh, they can be a, a very unifying force and they do a lot of good a lot of money is raised for charities um, they generate a lot of enthusiasm from most people as well um, so yeah I'm a definite fan of the monarchy and I remember a couple of years ago I was actually in the UK when Harry and Meghan got married and barring everything that's happened since then uh, that was just a tremendous occasion a, a great occasion for Windsor and it was it was good good to see at that time. And as far as uh, good to see, uh, yeah, I've mentioned earlier, my wife and I uh, really love medical shows uh, and UK produced shows. And we have really, we're very enamored with Martin Clunes. And oh, yeah. I, I'm hoping that you, you are also a fan of Doc Martin. Uh, <laughs> Or uh, let's see, we just started watching Casualty, London Hospital. It's oh, yes. Sort of, sort of a docudrama and very, uh, very graphic, very front and center. Uh, you know, my wife has watched for a few years now, Call the Midwife. And now I get the latest episodes and it's just, it's just really riveting to me. Uh, do any of those shows register with you? And do you happen to know Martin Clunes? Because I'd love to have a call with him like this. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll see if I can gather some connections. Uh, Martin Clunes <laughs> has been famous for a long time. He's been on the comedy circuit. I'm a, a fan of his. Uh, I haven't seen uh, Doc Martin. I'm sorry, I must confess. So I'll put it on my list. Um, Casualty um, has been a show in the UK for, for years on BBC One. I have seen that, uh, not for a few years though, but it has been very popular. 
there's other medical shows I, I know I can recommend to you if you like. Uh, there's one called Holby City, which is also very good as well. Okay. Check that out. And uh, you, I remember you telling me last time that you like British comedy as well. Yes, Get yes, very much medicine. so. Because obviously I'm not going to come home now and watch medical shows. I get not it. Not in yeah. this situation. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, no, yeah, I'm a little more, uh, you know, we, my wife and I will agree with on Faulty Towers. She loves oh, that yeah. one. But when it just comes to the complete slapstick foolishness of Monty Python, I'm the only one who still laughs at that stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, and we, uh, the IT crowd is a, uh, a another one. And I call it kind of like uh, the office meets Monty Python. And um, anyway, you know, we, we really enjoy uh, that. It, it, we just think that those are produced uh, generally much better than American shows. And, you know, I'm absolutely a red, white, and blue American, but we really appreciate the, uh, the UK productions. Yeah, made some great shows over the years. I, I believe the classics were all from the 60s to early 90s as well. There's another one called Keeping Up Appearances. Have you seen that? I have not. Okay, that's a good one. Your, your wife might enjoy that one more. It's uh, really, really funny. Um, one Foot in the Grave is another comedy, which is an absolute classic. Okay. I think we might have seen one episode of that one and thought, well, we might want to come back to it. Um, listen, I appreciate you taking some time to just kind of have a little bit of lighthearted chat here. And uh, after our conversation about COVID-19 and this uh, pa pandemic, um, Dr. Dan, what could you, or what would you like to maybe uh, leave folks with? Um, we've talked for, you know, 25, 30 minutes almost, and, um, you know, people maybe see this or watch this and they go away. What do you want them most to remember? Uh, well, firstly, Jody, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure to, to join you again, talk to you, and um, I really feel like we've gone through some very intelligent and important questions. Um, I would just say to everybody to take this seriously. It's going to be over. Nobody, nobody in the medical community, nobody out there who's a leader wants to see this last forever. We just have to get to grips with things. We have to get on top of the pandemic, make sure that the curve, which we all know about, is well and truly on the way down. Future strategies are numerous in their possibilities. We, we can go a number of different ways from here, but the most important step now is that everybody just stays at home, practices common sense hygiene, continues social distancing, and this will be over and we're all keeping our fingers crossed. It will be sooner than we think. I want to resume my, my normal life too. Every, every doctor's been thrown into it and, and doesn't want to be there seeing this degree of illness at the front lines. We're not used to it. I'm used to seeing every day heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, strokes coming into the hospital and, and focusing on those because we've got enough illness out there that can make us sick. Let's get on top of this, whether it's a vaccine in the future or effective new treatment, we, we will get there, uh, but everybody just be patient. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, and uh, appreciate you joining our my little spot here in the Midwest from your place there on the east coast you make the world a little bit smaller that's why we call this high neighbor because really if anything has shrunk the world even more it's a pandemic right that's very true thank you again and uh bless your efforts and of your your colleagues you all are heroes thank you jody you stay safe too thank you